Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus. This is episode 219. I am the show host, Kyle. On this show, I'm going to be discussing how America's apathy towards the wars really allow for bad things to just to continue to happen for absolutely no reason. I've been rereading America's War for the Greater Middle East, A Military History by Colonel Andrew Basevich. And reading that book is such a fantastic reminder of how long these wars have been going on, how all the stuff we're currently doing has already been tried and has already failed. Yet the policies continue, Americans continue to die, we continue to waste money in these wars. And of course, probably the most horrific thing is just the toll it takes on the civilians in all these other countries. For those of you who would like to share the show, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com or libertarianinstitute.org. So I think it made the most sense to start out with Afghanistan, just because Afghanistan is America's longest running war. In Basevich's book, you know, he starts off in the 1980s under Reagan when the U.S. policy in Afghanistan is explicitly to destabilize that state, to prop up these, at that time, Mujahideen or kind of Islamic fundamentalist actors in order to do what they saw as just, you know, kind of interfering with and destabilizing the Soviet Union. Now, it doesn't seem like anybody at that time really thought, well, what kind of effect is this going to have on the Afghan civilian? Is giving weapons to, you know, people who were foreign fighters to Afghanistan, like I said, Islamic fundamentalists, and artificially powering them and propping them up, you know, what is that going to do to the average Afghani? Now, certainly, the Soviet war against the Afghans was absolutely brutal and is absolutely condemnable as well, but that, you know, obviously doesn't justify the U.S. intervention there. Now, eventually, we get to, you know, 2001, and there, uh, Osama bin Laden is hiding out in Afghanistan. He is not an Afghani himself, and most of his followers were not Afghanis as well. However, since, you know, the physical location of Osama bin Laden was Afghanistan on 9-11, then the United States ends up invading that country, overthrowing the Taliban regime with little debate on, you know, really what impact the Taliban had on, you know, actually 9-11 itself. And if you read Scott Horton's book, Fool's Errand, you'll really see how the Taliban made a couple of efforts to help the Amer, or at least one effort to help the Americans get Osama bin Laden prior to 9-11, and then even afterwards offered to give them to the Americans to avo- avoid an American invasion of Afghanistan. Yet that, you know, that that's never talked about. Nobody wants to debate and wants to talk and wants to think about, hey, if we go to war with the Taliban here, we're going to kill mm-hmm, a couple thousand, maybe a couple, you know, 10,000 Afghani civilians. Is this really worth it? You know, is it worth it to these people? You know, do we have the right to do this? But again, you know, that's never talked about because that's a really hard and unpleasant kind of thing to talk about. The fact that, you know, when our Congress uh, people were voting for the 2001 AUMF say that allowed us to go into Afghanistan, not only were they voting on a resolution that would, you know, pursue Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, they were also voting on a resolution that would have killing thousands of the Afghanis as one of the, you know, outcomes of that conflict. Now, of course, it's gone much further than that since, and, you know, the hundreds of thousands of Afghanis at the very least have been killed in the war, and, you know, thousands of American soldiers. But again, you know, there's really no talk and debate about. It. Now, in America's longest war, you know, since it started, we've had many different generals try many different strategies. We've tried different Afghani leaders. We've tried, you know, more air raids and bombing campaigns. We've targeted the drug trade. We haven't targeted the drug trade. We've tried to provide substitute crops other than opium for the farmers and our poppy for the farmers. You know, we've, we've tried working with the Pakistanis and it, you know, time and time again, nothing absolutely helps. And here we have Trump going with the same old tried policies that have been tried and failed. We know that these policies only waste American money, only waste American lives, and only kill innocent Afghani civilians and produce no outcome that's better for the American people. And so why does this keep happening is the obvious question. I mean, reading Basevich's book just makes me want to ask time and time again, okay, so when's it over, right? We've tried everything. We've done A, B, C, D, E. We've tried all the way through Plan Z, and nothing's worked. Nothing's made the situation better. Hell, even after we ran through the whole alphabet the second time, now we're trying Plan B again because, you know, what else are we going to do? Now we're trying Plan D again because what else are we going to do? 
And, you know, this should be in the faces of all American as in this past week alone, two Americans have been killed in Afghanistan. Now, I'm sure tens of Afghanis have also been killed in the conflict or suicide bombings as well. And if you look at how bloody the past couple of years in Afghanistan have been, it's, it's nearly unbelievable how the people there continue to try to live anywhere near a normal or stable life in a country that has been turned upside down for so long. But, you know, the the most unbelievable part of it is, I guess that if nobody cares, right, if we don't care enough to actually realize that, hey, we're trying the same policy again now under Trump that we tried under Obama, and it didn't work then, and it's not working now, then why don't we say to stop it? And that's just because nobody cares. Because people, you know, 12 children trapped in a cave in Thailand, everybody cares, the media attention is on it 24-7, some Americans die in Afghanistan, eh, you know, they run the story, they glorify the guy, they say he was on a great mission, and that was it. And so, you know, nobody likes to talk about it, and it just keeps getting worse, and it keeps killing people. Now, I, I, it just, it drives me nuts that, you know, if if this is the situation, if we're all agreed, we really don't care about this anymore, then why not just end it? Why just not stop the killing? Stop the violence? I guess some of it has to do, you know, you gotta concede with the, you know, think tankers and the politicians all agreeing that, yeah, it has to go on. But mainly, this is because all these people can't admit that they were wrong in the past. You know, it's amazing that so many members of Congress who voted for the Iraq war are still in Congress. Hell, we almost elected Hillary Clinton, who actually, you know, voted for it. So in a lot of ways, it's astounding, you know, how much apathy, I, you know, the best word that Americans have towards the war. I read a pretty good article by Stephen Walt on Afghanistan. I'll link to it in the show notes page. And he just explains how this is the worst war. Uh, Americans keep dying here. We keep spending money here. Afghanis keep dying. Nothing's working. It's been 17 years now. What are we still doing? You know, it's only because nobody could care. Nobody could even pay the smallest amount of attention to it that this could still go on. And, you know, even the tragic events that you would think would have to captivate people, like a couple, I think it was 2015 or 2016, a U.S. plane ends up bombing and then strafing fleeing doctors and patients of a hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan. But even an event like this, can draw enough attention for people to take the, you know, uh, it'll take a couple hours, maybe a couple days to actually learn what's been going on in Afghanistan, mostly because people haven't been paying attention to it for so long. And so many people have died in the U.S. has tried so many different policies. But if they took that time, if they had, uh, you know, a couple weeks on TV talking about Afghanistan, like they spent the cup past couple of weeks talking about those boys trapped in the cave in Thailand, then people would be educated, and people would know, and people would care. I hope, at least. The last thing I'll mention on Afghanistan is the UK is saying an additional 440 troops there, about doubles their troop levels in the country, and this is at the behest of the United States. And so I, do, I think this does go to show it's just not, you know, the, the Americans. I'm just not bashing on Americans. In fact, the next war I'm going to talk about is Yemen, and in that case, you know, the you, while I constantly harp on the united states the uk bears a lot of responsibility is here as well they're good allies with the saudis and the emirates and they both sell the saudis and emirates a lot of weapons as well even though i mean at this point they damn well know that those weapons are going to be used to kill innocent yemenis so rather than recapping the whole war in yemen if you're interested in that link to an episode in the show notes page where i covered it but i just want to point out that this is a u.s war that if donald trump wanted to Tomorrow, the war could pretty much be over. I mean, if the Saudis and the Emirates really want to put their ground forces in harm's way and put their own civilians in harm's way in Yemen or spend tons of money, I guess, trying to uh, make Africans do it for them, then that's maybe something they could do. But they can't continue the bombing campaign. Uh, the blockade will be very hard to continue, especially if the United States made any effort at all in the UN to expose the war crimes that the Saudis and the Emirates are committing right now in Yemen. Uh, maybe it could stop. However, again, uh, we have another situation where Americans just don't seem to care. You know, we've had about half, I think, or more of Yemeni medical facilities have now been destroyed by this war. Think about that. In the United States, you know, a, a, a bill like Obamacare, you know, repealing it or making small changes to it would have an enormous debate, enormous impact on Americans. Everybody would be talking about it. Everybody would have opinions. Everybody would have strong opinions. In fact, many times, you know, saying that we, we can't even associate with people who think the opposite of us on this. But here we are supporting a war that has destroyed half, over half of Yemeni medical facilities 
And nobody even says a word. I think in part this is probably because it's always framed as a proxy war. They always say, well, this is the Saudi bad side versus the Iranian bad side. And yet if anybody just cared enough to look it up and try to figure it out, or hell, even Jane Ferguson, who works uh, for PBS, did a fantastic report on this showing, well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than just being a proxy war. They're saying that the Iranians are smuggling missiles into Yemen through bags of flour. And yet they're providing absolutely no proof of this. In fact, all the evidence they've pointed to has turned to to be completely debunked. You have weapons expert Scott Ritter explaining that, you know, these are Yemeni missiles. Uh, IHS Jane's, uh, uh, you know, international group on the issue has said that, yeah, these are Yemeni missiles. When the Americans pointed towards saying, hey, these parts were made in Iran from this missile, they didn't point out that there was also parts in that missile made from are made in America as well. So, you know, this isn't conclusive proof that those (laughs) missiles are, you know, from Iranian sources. And I was just reading an article yesterday that was published in The Drive of All Places about how Yemenis uh, have a bunch of, or at least not a couple, U.S. Vulcan cannons. And these are 20 millimeter cannons that do a whole hell of a lot of damage. I think they're meant for anti-aircraft, but they've apparently been using them, uh, you know, just against ground forces. And these are American-made weapons. And here are the Houthis, a a group in, you know, Yemen using them. And nobody is claiming that the Houthis are backed by the Americans, even though it was all those weapons that the Americans gave a long time, well, not long time, partial Houthi ally Salah that ends up, you know, being the weapons that the uh, Houthis are using to take and conquer Yemen. And again, you know, if you look at it and who actually provide the weapons, hell, the Americans are playing a much bigger role than the Iranians here. Now, they'll call it a political alliance between the Houthis and uh, the, the Iranians. And this is a really weird term, I find, because what it basically means is that the Iranians care that Houthis are dying and uh, they may have alternative motives like their hatred of Saudi Arabia as well. But, uh, you know, the, the, there's been no proof to show that Iran is backing the Houthis. But being able to, you know, frame it in that proxy war term seems to be enough to make people apathetic about the issue. Well, this is Muslims killing Muslims. They've been doing it forever. We really don't understand it. And that's kind of just the way it is. And you have a a similar situation in South Sudan, where under Barack Obama, the United States was fundamental in creating and then empowering a government in South Sudan. And then just last week, or uh, yeah, just last week I saw the story, but it was about a month's period between April and May. That the South Sudanese army, uh, you know, the state army killed 232 civilians and raped 120 girls and women, right? You know, some of these girls definitely not of age. So this is statutory rape. You know, this is forced rape by soldiers. They roll into your camp. They shoot everybody. They can't rape and they rape the rest. And while the United States had a large role in doing this, uh, certainly... Uh, you know, the, the leader of that country isn't somebody like Gaddafi that were, you know, you know, took and killed out, took out and killed. And I'm not saying that, you know, that would be the right policy to just go and kill the leader there. Yet there's, you know, no interest in it. There's no, look at what the America's role is here. And knowing that could be important just so you don't make the same mistake again. Yeah, maybe we can't, you know, really restore South Sudan or in any way help those people to stabilize their country. But this should certainly be an indication that the next time the U.S. is thinking around meddling somewhere, Venezuela, let's say, the Americans know what happened in Iraq. They know what happened in Libya. They know what's going on in Yemen. They know what happened in Somalia. They know what happened in South Sudan. And they are positive that it's a very bad idea to go into Venezuela because it's going to kill millions of people. It's going to put Americans in the quagmire. American soldiers are probably going to die unnecessarily. And it's not going to help a single person other than maybe some weapons makers and executives at Lockheed Martin, Halliburton, Boeing, and others. You know, I mentioned Somalia and Libya there. And it's worth putting out that, again, here we have a situation where the U.S. has had, in Somalia, long-term intervention in, I guess, seven years now or so of Libya, where the United States has been bombing and intervening and overthrew the leader there. And yet, a lot of Americans couldn't find the countries on the map. A lot of Americans have no idea that we've undertaken these massive bombing campaigns. You know, we've had U.S. soldiers die in Somalia over the years. And certainly there have been situations uh, like the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia where people did take a little bit of attention to notice. But it's been a long time since that's happened. And, uh, you know, since, like I said, it's apathy. Yet Somalis keep dying. You know, it's amazing how many people I talk to and don't realize that the bombing in Mogadishu just, you know, a year or two ago now was the largest terror event in Africa in history. 
600 and something people have probably died in that attack. And yet when that attack happened, there wasn't, you know, people changing their Facebook post, uh, you know, uh, profile pictures to Somali fleds. There wasn't a massive outcry of support. There wasn't massive drives to raise money. I mean, people raised more money for Andrew McCabe after he lost his job in the FBI than they cared to, uh, you know, try to raise for Somalia after that happens. And so, you know, it's just disappointing that so many people could die, so many people could suffer, and a lot of times at the hands of the Americans, or at the very least, uh, as secondary or, you know, tertiary con, con, you know, consequences of the American foreign policy. And, uh, you know, in that case, we can never step up. We can never condemn our government. We can never condemn those actions. Israel is a, another really fantastic example. If you look at the billions and billions of dollars the U.S. has given the Israelis, and more importantly, I think the political cover that we've given them at the U.N., it's amazing that no Americans stop and focus. I think of all the things I probably talked about in today's show, there's probably the largest movement uh, within the U.S. to really help the Palestinian people. Uh, boycott, divest- divestment, and sanctions is a movement with some backing. Uh, you know, the I think Roger Waters from Pink Floyd is a big supporter of that. And while, you know, I'm not personally a fan of sanctioning anyone, you know, there are pro-Palestinian movements in the United States, and some of those attract some political attention sometimes and so there's you know not complete apathy on the parts of everyone but uh there there's a lot of apathy in the united states and you know you could really see that by an example like this you have a, a flotilla of some injured palestinians and what they're trying to do is leave gaza because there's no medical facilities able to treat them in gaza and you know take a speedboat over to cyprus now it, it's not like um this is a massive boat that has any weapons on it and it's not like the israelis you know just stop search the boat and then let it pass they turned it around and said no you can't go see medical treatment it's absolutely unbelievable uh that the americans could still be fine with israelis allowing palestinians to die or take unnecessary amputations and not let these people see medical treatment not even within israel it's not even going to you know be the israelis footing the bill for their medical treatment even though many times you know the the people have absolute right like the israelis owe them that medical treatment because they've unnecessarily injured them the settlement expansion is also a good example of apathy just because it's happened over such a long time and I think this is, again, kind of like the Yemen proxy war thing where people say, well, you know, the the Arabs and the Jews have been killing themselves for the, each other forever, and we really don't know what's going on with it, so it's just kind of happening. But year after year, Palestinian homes are either destroyed or taken from Palestinians and given to Jews or, you know, Israelis. And, you know, what would be the worst offense if it happened in the United States? Nobody cares that, you know, it's our tax dollars. It's the money, our money that our government's giving away that's helping and allowing this to happen. To switch, uh, you know, topics a little bit, I do want to cover the NATO summit on this show just because this is, uh, you know, a really big deal going on right now in the news. I think some highlights, one that shouldn't be surprising, the United States isn't going to leave NATO and seems to uh, continue to endorse Article 5, which is the mutual defense pact. You know, always blown up to say, well, if Russia invades Poland, the United States is going to war there. But I think would, you know, apply, let's say, if Iran launched war against Turkey or something like that. Not that that's anything that would happen. Trump did say, and I'm sure this is going to drive people nuts, that the U.S. is now looking for a 4% of GDP from NATO member countries to be spent on defense. Now, I'm guessing this is probably more of an art of the deal style tactic, and he's saying four and trying to get like two or two and a half or something. But it just goes to show that the United States is the furthest country, I guess, from uh, Russia, assuming that you're not counting Alaska and, you know, the Russia's eastern border there. But, you know, if you're really looking at where all the defenses are piled up and stuff, all of these countries are much closer to Russia. This is where everybody's worried about the offense starting. Is Russia moving into Eastern Europe and then Western Europe? Well, none of these countries want to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. So maybe that should tell Donald Trump, hey, maybe Russia's not that big of a threat. However, you know, his position is just to bully the other NATO countries into spending more on defense so the United States isn't quite so heavily subsidizing their defense. Now, the most ridiculous thing I, I've heard this week is that Macedonia will be given a invitation to join NATO, something they've long sought after. 
it's really unclear what the hell the Macedonians could provide at all to the defense of the United States. They have less than 10,000 soldiers and absolutely no air force whatsoever, but now they need, never need to build one because they have the United States Air Force signed on to them. What makes this thing to me so ridiculous, though, is that for the longest time, Macedonia wasn't allowed uh, to join NATO because of a dispute Macedonia had with Greece. Now, this dispute, of all things, is over Macedonia's official name. The northern province of Greece is Mas- the Macedonian province. And so I guess the Greeks are worried that if Macedonia is recognized as the official name of Macedonia, then they're going to claim they also own the Macedonian province of Greece. That seems, I don't know, like a somewhat ridiculous concern, but the world's kind of a ridiculous place. But, you know, the United States talks about how essential NATO is and how essential all these NATO memberships are. And yet here we are looking at Macedonia that's been kept out of NATO for all these years because the Greeks don't like their name. Don't you think if it was that important that they would have found a way around it? But this shows just how absolutely stupid it is and how it's all a giant geopolitics game. Now at the NATO summit, there's some stuff going on uh, that's not being talked about so much in the media. And that is Mike Pompeo pushing uh, NATO countries to adopt sanctions on Iran. I really hope the other countries don't go along with it, that they either find a way to stay within the JCPOA, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, or create another nuclear agreement with Iran. Uh, This is one of the great things that took war off the table, one of the few really good things that Barack Obama did. Hopefully it can be salvaged, but the United States is trying really hard to undermine it. The last thing I want to talk about is to provide some clarification on what's going on with North Korea and the denuclearization talks there. It seems to me that the issue is is, is a miscommunication between the United... I shouldn't say miscommunication, because maybe it's deliberate. But there's a difference in what the North Koreans want and what the Americans are pushing as far as the denuclearization process go. I'm going to link to an article in the show notes by Moon of Alabama uh, that really goes in depth on this. But basically, you know, the, the North Koreans and the Americans kind of agreed that they would take three steps. The final and third step was to be the denuclearization, but there's supposed to be like a normalization of relationships and, uh, you know, some peaceful steps, you know, developing bonds and agreements between the two nations other than denuclearization. And so it seems that Bolton went and told the North Koreans, well, we're going to start with denuclearization. They're saying, whoa, 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 not so fast. We have all these other, you know, kind of diplomatic things that we want to get through first. This is something that, you know, a lot of um, people have talked about, especially, uh, I think, people who genu- genuinely want peace between North and South Korea and understand the benefits of North Korea not only giving up their new nuclear weapons, but just American detente with North Korea. And that is that this is going to be a process and that trust has to be built before North Korea denuclearizes. All right, that's where I'm wrap up the show for this week. ForeignPolicyFocus.LIBSYN.com, LibertarianInstitute.org. I'm on YouTube and BitChute at Immersion News, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify. If you can rate and like the show, I really appreciate it. Subscribe to the show anywhere you can. I write the daily news roundup at the libertarianinstitute.org. I'm, uh, you know, also got my own news website, immersionnews.com. And guys, continue to share the show. I really do appreciate it. And for those of you who really want to help out, check out patreon.com slash foreign policy focus and donate to the show.